Harlem, man. Harlem, Harlem. I be in Harlem, man. I be in Harlem, man. We the only thing moving, man. Only thing moving, man. Deep in the game, mob. Yup. Yeah. Uh. Uh. Fortieth. Fortieth. Harlem. Harlem. Brett. Well, now, children. Tonight, old Uncle Tom want to tell you the real, true story. This is the original studio. Where NWA created all their magic. Cruising down the street in my six four. The godfather of West Coast rap right here, Mr. Alonzo Williams. How are you doing today? So folks, how you doing today, Doc? I've always been an innovator. Okay. So when you see that shit in the uh the concentrate out of concert, I'm a hater, fuck that. <laughs> I'm the motherfucker that make everything happen, okay? Nobody knew the direction we were gonna go. And the damn sure was not fucking gangster rap. <laughs> Easy like playing games with people money. Mm -hmm. Easy in the movie. Easy got Dre out of jail. Okay. What they didn't tell you is the way got him out twice already. You had got him out already twice. twice. Okay. Okay. I mean, the Jerry wasn't fucking with Easy. Okay. So, for you to name your group Niggas with Attitudes, I'm like, dude. And Jerry was concerned about that. Mm. These motherfuckers? Yeah, you knew all. Q, really? These, these motherfuckers. <laughs> the version I have of him as a 14 year old kid, he wasn't that kind of kid. Mm -hmm. Okay. At, uh, 18 year old, 19 year old Dre wasn't that kind of what that kind of cat. Y'all yeah, damn sure wasn't. <laughs> Not at all. Damn sure was like, <laughs> He never really scared me. Like he never really. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nobody in this game been as consistent as I have. Mm -hmm. I'm people just now seeing my name and face, but you see my name and face every fucking where in almost every documentary on West Coast hip hop for a reason. Mm -hmm. Whereabouts in Compton did you grow up? Uh, man, I grew up, I actually grew up just outside of Compton, but I went to school in Compton, Centennial, Vanguard, uh, St. Albert's Catholic School, and I grew up in L.A., I grew up in L.A. County, which is about, yeah, about six, about a block from Compton, actually. Okay. So, I'm, I'm definitely a Compton native, I just, my address just didn't reflect that. Look, you were bootlegging LPs back then, I heard. How did, how... Uh, I can't even put that in my head. How, how did you do that? What was the process well, of that? Well, it wasn't so much bootlegging LPs. We were just bootlegging the mix. Oh, okay. Because okay. we were one of the first uh, first DJs to have our 1200s. And my boy, Unknown DJ, was getting uh, mixes out of New York. Mm. And it was dope. But the mm. music they were using was different from our format. So we decided, once I bought some 1200 turntables, we decided to start blending our own mixes. And once we learned how to record them and make the uh, acetates and the plates and everything, we start selling them and it blew up for us. Mm -hmm. So that's what uh, financed a lot of what we did for us initially in the studio. So you guys would, I guess, lack of better word, sell them out of your trunk or what, what were you doing? A, well, see, I worked for a record distributor. For my last job, my last job in 1979 was for a record distributor. So I had all the phone numbers to the VIPs and all the record stores, Magic Disc, everybody. Okay. So I was able to, they knew my voice. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have one of them voices that's, very recognizable. If you ever talk to me on the phone, you know, when I call you back, you're going to know my fucking voice, okay? 100%. My voice has never been confused with nobody else, okay? <laughs> and uh, people who knew me, they would buy from me. They knew my voice, and I walked into the store. To, uh, about a year or so later, after I had left the record company, they recognized my voice, and they bought from me. And because I had a good product, I established an underground distri distribution network, all the local stores, so I became the guy to go to whether you were um, Easy E, DJ Quick, I had to connect with the Squad Me, Steve Yano. Mm -hmm. So I, because I had, I had worked that, worked that, and created that network here in LA through my bootleg situation. When I, when I went legit, mm -hmm. everybody came to me because uh, the thing with records and especially Swap Meets mm -hmm. is that if they can't find, if your record don't sell, they want to give it back to you and get my money back. Mm -hmm. Or if it was on consignment, come get them. They're not selling, taking up space. But if I don't know where to find you, you're not dependable, mm -hmm. and I was dependable, I was reliable. Mr. Mr. Park, Mr. Chan, Cletus Anderson, All uh, Kelvin, everybody, they knew if, if I sold you a record, I understood the game enough, I kept enough product in the pipeline, so if I had a record that didn't sell, I could replace it with one that did sell. Mm, okay. And I, and I became the uh, out of the trunk so-called distributor. That's how easy guys and stuff uh, through through the swap meets, whatever he came to me, uh -huh. and I had to connect with Greg McIntyre. Hey, hi, this is Greg Mac McIntyre, and we're gonna go to the phones right now and find out what's going on. Hello, who is this? Yo, what's up? This is Lorenzo Patterson. Yo, man, where you calling from? I'm calling from Compton, and I wanna hear Easy E's new record. What's it called, man? Yo, it's called Radio. You got it. 
it, you call the right station, and here it is. So eventually, man, all my, everything that I had worked with between the clubs mm -hmm. and the bootlegging came together and made for a unique situation in the very beginning of West Coast Hip Hop. That's why I'm the guy. Bobby. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell me about what West Coast Hip Hop was like, you know, back then. You know, being being um, uh, involved in it, not necessarily the rate, but being involved in it. What you was know it what, like? Dude, back it, was, then? it was the Wild Wild West. Sounds like it. It was the Wild Wild West. Nobody had any any straight. Any uh, no idea of what was what was going to happen? We had Tidy T doing Battle Ram. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We had Mix Master Spade. To the beat, y'all. You just don't stop. A Mix Master Spade, and I'm ready to rock. So when, when, when the Egyptian Lover dropped his stuff, we dropped our stuff. Our first record came out sound like a Run DMC cut. I was promoting Run DMC at the club. I brought Run DMC and Curtis Blow to the Eve After Dark. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, it was just nobody knew the direction we were going to go. And it damn sure was not fucking gangster rap. <laughs> we dare not thought it. It was nowhere. And me and a buddy of mine was talking about that earlier there. Like, man, you know what, dude? That was such a fluke of history. It was like one of those things that, you know, Columbus, you discovered what? Man, what well, people are already standing here, motherfucker. What, nobody <laughs> ain't discovered shit. But because it happened, the way yeah. it happened, you know, it's just amazing, man. It's yeah. just fucking amazing. No, 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 no. We get the knees. Huh? We get the knees. Huh? Hey, what's up? I'm going to go outside make sure nothing's popping off, all right? I want you to keep these fat asses shaking. Don't play none of that street-ass rap shit, all right? I want these motherfuckers to think about pussy, not pistols. Yellow. Huh? So you talking to my lady, man. Keep your motherfucking hands to yourself. All right. I first fell in love with DJing was at Campanella Park okay. in uh, Compton. Contrary to popular belief, we partied our asses off as youngsters in Compton. Mm -hmm. They gave dances at my junior high school, my high school, and at the parks. The, the, record, the radio stations would come out to the parks and give dances. And even though there was always an element of gangsters around, mm -hmm. but they were a different type of gangster. They were they were uh, so. well dressed, oh. iron jeans. Mm -hmm. Stacy Adams mm -hmm. shined. Eight Stacy Adams, the little ace deuces, and they didn't really mess with civilians. They would be there three or four cats, you know, representing the neighborhood or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was just cool. So one day I go to Capitola Park and I see this rolling by them. I, Talked to him about this a couple of times. He was he was up there at Camp the Park DJing for KGFJ, the radio station yeah. at that time. And I fell in love with what he was doing. Mm -hmm. But I was under the impression, I'm a dumb kid, that you had to be a radio DJ to do that. Because there was no mobile DJs. Mm -hmm. The only time I've ever seen a mobile DJ was attached to a radio station. And by the time I got to the 12th grade at Gardena High School, I was offered a uh, opportunity to go to broadcast school. And I figured that would be a great chance for me to become a street jock. That's what they called the street jobs. Okay. And um, I did it, and I, uh, it was, I was about 19 years old, and disco was cracking, and you couldn't get a job in a nightclub nowhere because it was all white DJs, and a few black clubs had that they had. The DJs were only in there for 15 minutes in between the bands. Uh -huh. it, was it, was it was unheard of to have a DJ play all night. Okay. And some of my buddies from high school started doing disco dances and eventually I started getting into the disco dances mm -hmm. and I was making 50 60 bucks a night bringing equipment the whole nine yards yeah, like not that place. money back then right uh, that, was, that was all right Seven, but okay. they were making at that time seven eight hundred ah, off yeah. of my DJ okay. I'm mean, entertainment mm. so I uh, at one point in time man me and a buddy of mine took a chance and promoted a party at a golf course down the street from my house mm -hmm. and uh, the dance blew up and I became I was like a crackhead I'm like this is I DJed, I got paid for DJing, and I made money promoting. I'm like, fuck this, I'm going to be a promoter and a DJ. Uh -huh. And shortly after that, I started doing my own promotions. Okay. I started promoting myself as Disco Lonzo, superstar DJ. Nice. And, um, you know, it just kept going, man. It, I mean, me and Uncle Jam's Army was there. Roger from Uncle Jam's Army was right there with me. Everybody, everybody talks about what they did, but nobody did it 
like me and Roger. They was around, mm -hmm. but we were ones making it happen. And it's a difference. Mm -hmm. It's a difference in being the person that actually uh, created the flyers, bought the posters, paid for the posters. Now you may have hung them up, mm -hmm. but, but you didn't go out and pay, me. pay the deposits on the room. You you wasn't out there busting speakers and you know doing that kind of shit. You know, so it was a big difference in what people people take credit for being around mm -hmm. and actually doing it. Mm -hmm. Me and Roger did it. Okay. Okay, we did it. Yeah. Me, Roger, Curtis Garrett, LSD Promotions, Larry and Duro, Steve, uh, Steve Bradford, we did it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and this is before cell phones, before the internet, two, before no, no, it was all fax machines, it was all fucking manual labor. Damn. Hammers and nails on the posters, getting yeah. up, going out at 12 o'clock at night, hanging up posters, yeah. snatching posters down. Yeah. You want to get your ass whooped? Snatch my posters down. Yeah. See, this was the, this was the gangster mentality we had. You want to get you want to get your ass whooped? Uh huh. Take that poster. Take down. Take that poster down. <laughs> okay. And these were the kind of feuds we had. Now we didn't run stab nobody, shoot nobody. Yeah. But we slap you around a little bit because that mm -hmm. you know, dude, you not you know this was our territory. And you want to hang a poster? You welcome to hang it. You got to hang it either uh around. Either below or above. Mm -hmm. You don't go over my poster. You don't take them down. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. It's, it's, and that was the respect. A lot. Of, a lot. Of, once we start making money in the promotion game, a lot of new booty promoters come in. They want to be. Oh, we gonna that. No, 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 no. You may quit. have done it one time. Yeah, yeah. You won't do it no more. Never again. Never again. So, um, how did you, I guess, get into the owning club thing? What, that, you know, dude, that was a stroke of luck and a blessing. Uh. I lived in my mom's old house. She, my mom had passed. I lived in her house, and where, where she lived at, mm -hmm. it become dope infested. Everybody sold dope. Mm -hmm. But my dad had mom was split up, and I lived in her house. My dad didn't live far from me, and then he had a key to the house. Mm -hmm. And one day, I, my old man comes to the house, and he sees me counting some money, about six, seven hundred dollars. I just did an Alpine before the night of Saturday morning. My old man dropped by, and I'm in there counting money, mostly ones. Mm -hmm. And first thing came to his mind was I'm selling dope. And my old man was not going to let me go out like that. Mm -hmm. No, nah, dude, you can't sell no dope. Dude, I ain't selling no dope. And he came. And this is when parents checked on how kids made their money. Yeah. My old man came to Alpine Village, saw the, but I was still, I was telling the truth. Oh, Alpine was, Village, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I came, he came about two weeks later, peeped in on me, and, you know, he thought I was, what I, what I was, what I told him was the truth. Mm -hmm. And he got into the business part of the Alpine Village situation. And uh, he had a friend that owned, uh, just built a second floor, his nightclub, mm -hmm. a banquet hall, that wasn't doing a whole lot. And uh, he hooked me up with him. And that was back in 79, man. And uh, I've been there ever since.